Thank you for coming. I'm puzzled why my uh, little intro about ailing and aging and full of piss and vinegar. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why you came, and so I'm going to count on you to redirect me to address any areas of interest if I'm skipping over it or forget it. Um, so please, please feel free to interrupt or participate. Um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of storytelling, and I'm going to go off and all cut. This is not a linear talk. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not a linear brain anymore. Um, when I was two, if that's my first big memory, um, my mom was in hospital. I didn't know why. A friend, her friend took me down, pointed out this gigantic building with windows, and said my mom was very, very sad, and she was there waving at me behind the window and it was my job to make her happy. <laughs> and I can remember sort of standing on my head, you know, with a kid bum in the air kind of thing. And I knew already by then that it was a job that I had to do, and I also knew it was impossible. And that's one of my programs, is that I, uh, I believe it is my work to do things that aren't doable. Yeah. It's not always an advantage. When I was five, I was knocked out cold by a maypole that I was dancing around in, in kindergarten. And I've had a whole lot of injuries and events that to the outside world look like disasters or, or hardships or difficulties. But really, all I remember from that time is an hour or so, they couldn't find my mom. So an hour or so later, I was sitting on my kindergarten teacher's lap, who I adored. And she was writing the notes to a song that I had made up. She was writing the keys and the words. And I still have that piece of paper. And so from that externally apparent, well, disaster for a little kid. Um, and probably part of the reason I'm wonky still, um, it was just a delightful, delightful result. And I think in life, when crap hits, uh, as it does, um, that can happen if you're not, especially if you're not close to the possibility. My dad had, tuber had tuberculosis twice, 67, 69, uh, was bedridden for a year lost most of his savings, his previous company stole his, his pension plan, and he ended up with the job of a lifetime. He worked till he was 84, and he was the happiest person I think I've ever known. You know, so you can't decide that it's too late, and you can't decide that this is awful, 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 and I've hit a dead end, and there's nothing beyond that. Um, you. I've tried to open my mind to the possibility of, well, what's next? <laughs> what else is coming? Ooh, that hurt. Um, this is a feeding tube. Um, I have contracted, we think, Lyme disease, or one of the variations that is tick-borne, in 1996. Uh, I'm really getting disorganized now. Um, I live on a sheep farm, Topsy Farms. Um, my husband's ex-girlfriend introduced me. She was working with me at St. Lawrence College and uh, played matchmaker. And I entered this former commune environment in which everybody was entirely impoverished. Like, just, they had a meeting over whether they could buy a box of Kleenex when their <laughs> daughter started school instead of taking toilet paper because the image was bad. Um, <laughs> And that, that year, 1996, I had just been there a while. Our boys were born. I had uh, 80 years and four months between my dad and my son, who was still in diapers. And so I had ailing parents in Toronto and non-sleeping kids here. And I was doing my damnedest to do the impossible, which was get all the jobs done on the farm, <laughs> as well as working full time at St. Lawrence. And that year, we overdid the breeding. Christopher introduced Rito Arcots and a few others. And we always rescue the, the weakest of triplets or quads. And that year we had a few clints. We rescue everybody. Um, and I had a 
169 bottle fit lambs <laughs> to look after with one little girl from high school, from public school. <clears throat> and uh, so I set the precondition of my ailment with my not ever being enough for my parents and not managing to be enough for my students at St. Lawrence College. I was teaching a truck driving for women course that I designed and developed. And boy, that was fun. <laughs> it was really fun. Boy, you take a woman who's been beaten up by her, her mother-in-law, see, tangents, um, uh, because she's attending it, um, learning how to drive a tractor trailer. And she comes in <laughs> saying, I'm big and I feel powerful and I'm gaining skills in first aid and self-defense and what have not and, and uh, believing in yourself. So I was believing in myself a little too much in my capacity to do all these things and I got really sick. Um, we think the vector was deer to sheep to these foster lambs to me. If it had been on the end of my nose, I wouldn't have seen it. You know, I was sort of running in the house eating something, running back out and eating it. So, I've lived a tremendously adventurous earlier life. I was lucky enough not to get partnered permanently until my mid-30s, when I, uh, I'm happily married. But before that, I was traveling all over the place, either working two jobs or traveling. So I'm going to go back to earlier life. One of my passions is First Native to, uh, First Nations peoples. Um, during my master's in adult ed, I had the chance to go up to Inuvik, and I worked for the group that was doing the prequel studies before they divided the Arctic and Eastern and Western segments. And so I was working for COPE, which is the Committee for the Original Peoples Entitlement. And Nellie Cournier looked totally Norwegian like her father. It was Denny to the core, uh, which is her, her mother's, and was raised by the Inuit. And so um, the training I had in those two months when I worked for, for COPE and for Nellie in the Arctic was part of my <coughs> lifelong awareness of how how evil our capitalist and powerful society has been. Something else that reinforced that for me was, was spending time at the community college system in Saskatchewan. It was very uh, it was very radical at the time. No buildings, no permanent equipment. You didn't work to justify your existence. You worked because there were needs in the community and resources in the community and my job was to find them. And um, the Native women had just organized over the issue of the absolute zero zilch First Nations or Métis uh, foster families. They, uh, there was a couple of kids who had been looked after by their grandmother on the reserve, but they had a, had a outhouse, and so somebody reported them, the kids got scooped, they bounced through about eight white families and got adopted to the States for two months and then they rejected some chair. And so when I arrived, that's what the Native women were just starting to organize, that issue. They said, we need First Nations foster homes. And they said, nobody's qualified. And they said, tell us the qualifications, we'll find people who have these qualifications for you to check out they wouldn't accept the list. So it was passionate and intensive time. I had a boyfriend for a while who was Métis, and he was telling me that the only work that they could get, the whole family, not just the kids, was being hauled on a stone boat, boat behind the farmer's tractor, picking rocks out of the fields. So that was another good lesson for me. When I worked at, I was lucky, lucky, lucky growing up in the 60s, I think, or being a young adult in the 60s, there was so much possibility and choice in the summer job. You could earn your, your, your tuition for the next year. What a difference. And so I had a job at uh, uh, Air Canada the summer before Expo, and then I was hired for Expo. And 
I was raised by a, a nice white middle, almost middle class family in a nice white, almost middle class community. And my thinking was tight and small and close and what I knew. And at Expo, during the Seven Days War, we had kids whose parents were fighting on both sides. Mm. Right? In the restaurant. And all of a sudden, news that you read about that is very detached, very separate, becomes personal. It's no longer possible after an experience like that to, to be indifferent, to be unengaged. But you also have to select your engagement. Um, boy, I am being half out of it, but I like telling stories. Is this okay? Mm -hmm. yeah, so far. Um, my dad traveled a lot when I was very, very young with his job. And we were quite poor. But he loved the French language. He was born in the Eastern Townships. Very, very English family. But somehow for him it represented the freedom of the kids who did the downhill skiing and the hunting in the woods and, and uh, the liberty that he didn't have as a very proper Victorian raised family. So he'd come back from his trips three, two, three months with a present for me, a new word of French. And I can remember putting a footstool at the cottage on a chair so I could look at myself in the mirror. I can remember that. 34, and making myself a promise that I would learn to speak fluently. Moi, je parle français. <laughs> J'adore la langue. And I still use it. I uh, volunteered at our public school when my son was uh, in kindergarten. And I went for another 15 years until I was down to 81 pounds and, and uh, a month out of hospital. So I joined Topsy Farms, and it's, uh, it's an adventurous environment. <laughs> it, uh, it was a commune. It was built on a philosophy of huge respect and love for the animals and for the land, and trying to figure out how in hell as farmers to make a living that way. And when I had arrived, the commune had just broken up, and so um, almost everybody was being repaid with either land or money or all their donations. So I arrived into this impoverished environment with my husband's first wife, remarried to the shepherd, <laughs> quarter of a mile down the road, <laughs> and still telling the five men in the group what to do and how to think. <laughs> And she's a wonderful woman. She works with us now, and she does uh, a lot of our needle felting uh, creations. I love seeing people knitting, by the way. Oh. <laughs> and you're not using Topps yarn at the moment, Melody. <laughs> uh, no, I had to go to Ohio for this yarn. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so at first it was, uh, it was sheep, and it was more sheep, and we got up to 1,000 breeding ewes and 1,400, 1,500 lambs. And I was working full time, and I had aging, dying parents in Toronto. And uh, I got so sick with the Lyme or Babesia or Bartonella or whatever um, that I was no longer able to, well, doing the impossible got redefined, right? Trying to stay alive became my almost impossible. I was dying of malnutrition. And I went to 26 doctors. The best response I had was that I was, um, that they couldn't figure out what in hell was wrong with me. But the majority even put it in writing that I was crazy. Mm -hmm. Lyme disease in the 90s, I was literally told by somebody that it would be bad for tourism. It was, he was the <laughs> medical officer of health in Kingston. And the medical officer of health in Kingston in 2004 told me that it would be bad for tourism that ticks did not cross the border and were not in this region. <laughs> so, you know, you can take from something like that what you will. You can either spend days and weeks and months and a lifetime raging. But <coughs> I am my most my own 
most frequent companion. <laughs> <laughs> I really hate pe being around people who are raging and snarling and, and feeling sorry for themselves all the time. It's just lousy company. And so I read. Oh, I drown in books. I do audio books when I knit. This, by the way. I, it's one of the gifts from my illness was learning how to knit. I'd known as a kid but hadn't done it. And. Um, I lie flat on my back. My, I, it takes 17 hours a day to, to feed. Um, and so I lie flat on my back. And it, so this took me two years, but it's, I feel dressed up. <laughs> 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 um, but I have learned, I have learned to ask for help, actually. Boy. Women are so trained not to, and that it's a weakness, and that you're supposed to be strong and tough and courageous and, and whatever and self-sufficient. And you know what? Sometimes it's controlling as hell to not let people offer help. And it's a really sharing, opening kind of thing to do, to say, yeah, I need you to listen, or I need you to drive me somewhere, as my friend Nancy from nursery school <laughs> drove me today. <laughs> Um, it's almost dying is a good lesson, frankly. Uh, at, at 50 years of age, I was 81 pounds, and I had tried, no, I hadn't yet. Yeah, I had just done the whole medical route. And so my muscles are in huge spasm everywhere. Like, I can't feel my legs right now. That's why I'm leaning. And, um, where was I going with that? The standard medical route. Thank you. Yeah, try. Um, so my uh, GP finally sent me. No, I went, I went into the hospital because my lungs closed off. The diaphragm squished me so much that I couldn't get oxygen in. They tried, you know, first response and doing an oxygen mask, nothing. Um, so they drove me to the hospital with an osteopath <clears throat> holding the back of my neck which just eased the spasming just enough that I could get some breath in. And I had one of the most serene, peaceful, calm trips into the hospital. I was lying in the back of the car, holding onto my son's long hair, <laughs> with this guy holding the back of my head. My son, mouth by my ear, saying, listen to me breathe, Mom, just breathe with me. And I'm not sure I've been happier. Because I had really done everything I knew to do. And it was one of the times that I wasn't trying to push the world and the people around me, that I had just relaxed and opened and given in to what is, is. Okay? Whatever it will be, will be. It was very serene. Um, I was, well, I was disappointed. Um, so they decided to, because I fainted when they were going to take me in for um, some kind of test. They put me in overnight, but it was one of my lamb customers. Ruth, where are you? It wasn't you, but um, uh, we've got had some very faithful lamb customers for a lot, a lot, a lot of years. <laughs> and one of my lamb customers was a um, surgeon, and he was in his off hours visiting somebody. And he probably saved my life because the, uh, the test showed that I wasn't dehydrated, and what I was telling them didn't make sense. And so they had no reason to admit me. 81 pounds, <laughs> couldn't swallow anything by that point, food or, or water. So they put me in overnight, and then they decided to put in a tube for a day or two, he said. And that was May 2000. I can swallow distilled water, and that's it. This amount of time after this, the spasming in the upper and lower valve, valve closes everything off. Um, I have no idea why. I've tried acupuncture, which helped fabulously for about a year and a half. Um, but my body's nervous system keeps getting worse, so I became too sensitized to that. And then acupressure, which I thought would be more gentle, but that only lasted a year. And then I tried shiatsu, and I did a lot of counseling, and I've done naturopath, and homeopath, and osteopath, and every other path that you can think of. <laughs> and they help for a time, 
and then my body develops a resistance to it. And it just says, good, 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 uh, maybe, no. And it's um, pretty clear and arbitrary. It's one of the reasons that I keep, well, I keep it this way rather than the stomach stoma. Um, not because I want to say, people see I'm sick, and I do stand out in a crowd, boy, when people meet me, <laughs> they know who I am. <laughs> you know, the one with the two. Um, I don't think I would survive an operation having, because I can't handle the, uh, any of the drugs. No. And they don't carve a hole in your belly without something. Mm. And this follows an open passage. Like, it hurts, but it's just for the time, and then it's done. But it's a real pain when you're gardening and you catch on a plant and it goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, The recovery, I was four years in town um, trying, I was hooked up 23 and a half hours a day to this feeding machine um, while they were trying to build a safe room for me because I'm so environmentally sensitive. I, I'm loving this room with people. None of you smell to me. You're not, you're not chemically sodden, and thank you for that. Because yeah. uh, when I went to my expo reunion at 50 years later, um, we'd always have <coughs> the display is Natushi Po, right? <laughs> and so I put a sign on here, Natushi Po, <laughs> because cause so many people, when they hug, have, you know, fabric softener or deodorant or whatever. So it's been a long, slow recovery, but I'm recovering. I dig a garden. Man, I grow a beautiful garden. Whose melody you've seen my our place? Oh, it's beautiful. I love Just. your veg. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a vegetable garden disguised as a, as a bower for the bees and the, and the butterflies, because we've been a, a, a monarch way station for 35 years. Mm. I'm passionate about the earth. I really love growing things. I really love growing things. And I've got a photo of me lying on a pair of crutches. Because last year, the day that the foster land visitation ended, I was so tired and I was so relieved and it was time for me you know, to get back in the garden a month later. But first I was going to make muffins for my family. <laughs> but first. And I fell down the basement stairs. So I've got a picture of me lying on my crutches. Uh, planting my leeks because I had some <laughs> volunteers helping with some stuff that they weren't finished. <laughs> and so my husband, bless him, picked me up by the armpits, moved me down, <laughs> put me down, <laughs> and I planted. And so I've supported Loving Spoonfuls and its precursors, Loving Spoonful and its precursors for, let me see, Jake's 38, for 37 years. I have, uh, I have memories of having one baby at the breast and one in the, in, uh, with a diggy and tools digging up what I was just planting. <laughs> um, picking beans, calling others on the island, gathering the fresh foodstuffs, and every week I would take it into the <coughs> Partners in Mission Food Bank or to the Sisters of Mercy or to whoever else was doing the, the food supplies. So I'm the coordinator now for Amherst Island for, for fresh food. Um, that matters to me. First Nations things matter to me. When Nancy was driving me in today, I was knitting a Gord Downey sock scarf because for the last three years we've done fundraising for uh, the Downey Wenjack Fund. And uh, last year, with our sock scarves, we managed to raise $1,005. <laughs> I don't know what this year's count is yet, but um, it's something I can do flat on my back in bed that makes a tiny difference. Could right? you tell me what a sock scarf is? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, when Gord did his last summer's <clears throat> tour across Canada, um, he was ailing by that point. They knew he had brain cancer. And he wore what looked exactly like a scarf with a button. So it was neat and tidy. It wasn't catching on things. But it was keeping his, his instrument warm, was the quote he used. And so we designed one that looked like the one he was wearing there. And uh, $15 for each one, 10 from the purchaser and five from me, in Topsy's name, go to the Danny Winjack Fund. And they're doing some pretty, 
spectacular work, I think. If I was healthy, I'd be out there, you know? If I was strong and powerful, I'd be engaged differently, but I do, and that's what's really important in any issue in life, is to really figure out what the given parameters are that you can't do a damn thing about. And within those limits, maybe stretch them a little, um, what, what is possible, what you can do. Even coming here for a day and talking for, and I apologize, I'm going to have to leave at 5-2 uh, to hopefully make the ferry to get to bed two hours late. Um, yeah, you have to figure out what's doable rather than focus on what's not doable. So I invited the, uh, the Gadarakwe Aboriginal School to the farm because we grow a three sisters garden every year, my husband and I. He's 75, by the way, it works about 11 hour days now, down from 12 or 13, and uh, seven days a week. And he and I care about this. And so we, a three sisters garden has the corn and squash and beans that are all companions <coughs> for each other. It's a very traditional food. And the corn provides the structure and the strength, and the beans provide the uh, nitrogen into the soil that the corn really needs because it's a heavy feeder. And the squash provides shade cover and weed control and um, limits uh, the impact of other uh, things so there's less labor in the world. And if you wish, you do a fourth sister, which is the sunflowers for the spirits on the north side. And so we've had those for years. and and. Uh, Last year, they, <coughs> the Kingston Film Festival had a film called Three Sisters. And Loving School <coughs> had sponsored uh, a food program through the Gadarakwe School. And the first one was their visit to us and learning about, you know, Corn Sister and how she was growing tall and strong, kind of lonely, and, and the interaction of it. And so there was a lot of filming and footage and stuff, and, and uh, oh, they were picking out of my garden and eating pears off the trees and, and uh, seeing the downy commitment and, and have become friends. They've invited me back to a, a blessing ceremony of the drums in town, and so that is what I can do. It's within my realm of possible. I loved it. It was the highlight of my winter, going down for about 35 minutes to be part of the blessing of the drums. And when we did, I don't know if you've seen in the papers lately, we did a, did a big uh, dry stone festival on the farm. We're having to reinvent ourselves right now. Our farm was tremendously successful. Oh, I've skipped a step. Um, but my husband was driving the tractor too many hours and thinking about all the finances and the realities of, you know, one of the biggest farms in the province, one of the highest recommended for, for meat and for quality of care, and yet barely breaking even. And I'm sorry, I keep looking at you, Maura. <laughs> she's a shepherd. I mean, she's a knowledgeable <laughs> scientist. Um, <clears throat> and so we went into the wool business for our sins because our sheep grow really big, thick, luxuriant fleeces because they're outdoors all year round, the way animals, as far as I'm concerned, are meant to be. And so our guardian dogs and the, the sheep are a big part of our life and our daily care. And so the, uh, uh, we invite the public to shearing every year in, in April. We, we hire the best shearer in the province. Well, actually, he's represented Canada in the international shearing competitions. Um, and invite the public to come and, and enjoy and see real work in a real context. And to take samples and bring kids and take whatever. And so then uh, we opened this wool business, sending our wool by tractor trailer. We, we unload it by hand from the barn in these eight-foot bags, put it on a farm wagon drawn by a tractor, because until this past year we don't have a, didn't have, have an end-loading ferry. And so you couldn't fit a tractor trailer on the, on the ferry. So my man, not me, I took the pictures, I <laughs> hauled the bags down, Three, two flights of stairs, put them on the farm wagon, stacked them up, tied them on, drove the tractors down with the wagons behind them across the bay to then meet the tractor trailer and send our wool to Prince Edward Island, where, as far as we know now, uh, in Canada, the wool industry is, is 
it was dying. But just like so many of the crafts, they're recoming, I mean, hope, rebuilding. So they only use soap. The whole ethic about wool being prickly is almost always referring to commercially processed wool. Mm. Wool that's had sulfuric acid to strip the chaff and the lanolin. They add bug spray and they add fire retardant and there's two or three others possibly. And so wool is prickly if you've dried out the natural oils and broken the fibers and they're all got these little barbs. Ours is soap washed only. And so we're proud of it. But my family just taking on another task. We used the old ice house for a few years, but then there was a, um, a road widening, so we built a beautiful new wool shed two years ago. Um, and we have all kinds of sheepskin products. Nancy, you don't have, do you have your baby mittens in there? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so for my sins, yes, that's, that's a, a little <laughs> pair of baby mittens. <laughs> Um, I have six knitters who work for me. Um, I started trying to do it all. And I learned that I can't do it all. And uh, so one's a lady in her, she's 85 in Montreal. <laughs> but her best friend lives out by the army base and she's only 80. And they pick up the supplies that I send them to the pig and olive who are butchers for the meat. And uh, Lisa gets meat from us too. And so people buy meat from us, they go to Pig and Olive to pick it up, and my knitters bring their products to Pig and Olive, who kindly accommodate it, and our, our yarn. And you can make do. Just like my stepdaughter, who made do with toilet paper until she was allowed to have a box of Kleenex going to school. Um, it's, a mad, it's amazing what you can manage. Right? So my knitters and I are scrambling because there is more and more and more demand right now as we're competing with this guy. So our Rock Wall Festival was phenomenal. We had um, Dry Stone Canada came and built a um, 112-foot gorgeous stone wall, all from our field stones. And um, the, the farmers, the generations before us, hauled them out of the field so that they could make a living and put them in stacks along the verge. And so they're sitting there waiting for us eight, ten generations later. And so uh, Paul Carl from Queens here was kind enough to come out with Eartha. And they did a, a blessing of the land and of the grandmothers and the grandfathers because we wanted to acknowledge that we aren't the owners of the land. We're just kind of the latest caretakers. And we wanted very much to, to acknowledge that. So I'm going to wind up talking and wanting to interact more. Um, one of the things that I had set as a goal for this summer, I was pretty unwell last year, the uh, spraining my ankle and doing whatever to, kept me from, oh, swimming. God almighty, I left that out. One of my passions. <laughs> uh, Vicki Keith, you, many of you will know of her, lived on the island for a while. And I couldn't walk uh, when I was 81 pounds. And after four years of just sitting and being hooked up to a machine, my muscles were toast. Um, and she befriended me, and we would try to walk to the corner, and then I could walk to my son's next door, and then etc. And she got me in the lake one summer. And the whole childhood memory of play, you know, just, just infused me. But I was frozen. Right? I don't have very good circulation, so that was that was that for that. Next year we tried again, and I could swim, but kind of in this tight little circle, because one side works better. <laughs> <laughs> and the next year I could swim. I got up to half a mile um, and swimming three or four times a day. And I loved it, because the, the cool uh, reduces the inflammation that I carry all the time. And the exercise, I can build my strength without gravity, you know, without the, like walking really hurts and increases the pain. And um, swimming was just a delight. But I started getting diarrhea. And worse diarrhea. So this summer, this is both a good and bad story. Uh, we were doing a, a renovation from hell in our house um, that 
the toilet was basically falling through the floor, and the bathtub was dripping onto the dining room table, so it was not a rental we could postpone any longer. And I can't stand construction smells. So my son is part of this whole new move to sell off most of our sheep, repay our shepherd, and find a new way to make a life for our, our family. Because I'm rich in family. Our two sons and our daughter and our grandkids are involved with us and a best buddy of my son's. And so uh, Will was doing the reno and it was taking forever and ever and ever and ever. And so Jake had <coughs> bought a, a, an authentic yurt off from J Kijiji. And uh, I tried the bed that we had out there for visitors. <laughs> no way. So we moved it just within a quarter of an inch. It just took our queen bed. And so I would spend all afternoon and from the 7.30 or so at night until whenever in the morning looking and listening trees and birds and, and I had dreamed of camping out one night. I love camping. I used to do, I did a 10 day canoe whitewater trip uh, across the province and down Georgian Bay. And that's one of my really happy memories. I love a tent and all it evokes balloons. And so there I was hoping and like hope that I could get overnight one night in a tent. And instead, I had the whole summer in this gorgeous, hand-painted, hand-braided, horsehair, rope-tied yurt. And so a renovation from hell turned into yet one more gig. And so my biggest loss is that this summer it came clear that I can't swim any longer because Maybe it was just because of the end of the summer, but the, the concentration of bacteria in the lake. Um, luckily, we had my grandfather's potty up in the yurt, and it's really true love when your husband carries your potty in the morning. And it's pretty cool. But I was going with about three hours of very broken sleep and an awful lot of cramps and a lot of pain. So I'm having to accept that now as one more curtailment, probably. But I'll test it next spring, and I'll hope for it. And I'll garden as long as my body will allow, or my husband will pick me up by the armpits. <laughs> and I mean, I was dead at 50. I'm kicking at 72. <laughs> and uh, I think I'm really lucky. Cool, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have any questions at all? Or I was just going to say, I read with interest the uh, article just this weekend, I think, ah. on the farm and the, the, the dinner you provided. The feasting and the foraging and feasting. The foraging, yes. yes. Maybe you could tell them. Oh, I'd be it. delighted. Yeah. Thank you. The whole, the whole direction now that we're having to downsize, um, it's both a choice. It's hard to choose change when you're older and ill. You know, it really is. Melody, you were talking about retiring, and yep. it's scary oh, yeah. when all of a sudden there's the anomie of the structure uh, depleted. And so instead of a thousand ewes, we're going to go down to maybe 400, and my younger son was parachuted in the position because his older brother decided that we should go into the whole um, environmental um, ag tourism emphasis to try to make money. And we all love the land, and we're trying to save the land. And so the foraging and using the resources of the land in a way that isn't damaging or depleting makes sense. And so I did a foraging for natural dyes and then dyeing yarn as one of my, with a big outdoor cauldrons over the fire. You know. And then a woman, we keep finding, having these women find us and adopting us, which is great because we're volunteering and we can't afford to pay people. Um, and so this woman, Chef Ruthie, um, she came back to Kingston because her parents were aging and she was looking after her. Nancy's gone to get the car. I'm sorry. And um, so she took people out. They came on the 10 o'clock boat and it's a wonderful mushroom this year. And so they... Uh, 
and we had a fabulous little lunch feast delivered and cooked over the fire in the woods, but they were identifying mushrooms and lichens and, and all kinds of other edible properties in the woods. And we have six kilometers of hiking trails out to our bluffs and two kilometers just out to the sugar shop. And so uh, they tromped and explored all that area, came back and uh, sipped wine in front of this big outdoor fire. And then they, um, they were served a five course feast <coughs> in the yurt. And um, every single thing in it having come of or from the land. And so there was venison something, and there was lamb something, and there was there was trout that my grandson, my 12-year-old grandson, had caught and, and, and filleted for the last two months. And uh, it's just, it's all part of respect. One of the hard things to learn is to respect yourself and your own needs, not just the land and the, land and the people around you. That's a harder lesson. It's worth learning. Anyone? Yeah, Sally. You may not I recognize you. you. I can't remember your name. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's all right. It's Rabina, Bobby Shaw. Oh, Bobby! Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Anyway, just very quickly, I can attest that this lady is indeed full of piss and vinegar. <laughs> I first met her at a thing called a sewing circle on Amherst Island. I lived, I am an Amherst Islander. Yes. Once you've lived there, you always are, and I go back and forth. But do you remember the sewing circle? Oh, yes. Was that Elsie's? It was started, I think, in the late 1800s by Peter Truman's aunt. Yep. Anyway. Whose daughter was the woman, the ex-girlfriend who introduced me. That's <laughs> <laughs> For a small community. My <laughs> first journey over on the ferry when we moved over, somebody said, did you hear that so-and-so's run off with a shepherd? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oops. We don't keep secrets either. <laughs> an influence on me in in many ways because Sally would come to the sewing circle. I couldn't sew, I can't knit, I can't do any of that, but it doesn't matter. Nice women. And and you would bring a bowl of the most foul smelling <laughs> food. <laughs> and it was quite, usually quite in somebody's home yeah. and it was then that you began to be Yes, be that ill. was during my four years yeah. of uh, starting. And um, it was usually oatmeal with molasses. I don't know two why things I smelled so badly. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you were there, and, and every time that um, that I face difficulty, uh, I remember your your willpower and um, your ability to push through all that. Thank you. Bob. And I also want to say that I'm always very proud that I helped you put together your first brochure just as you were going into I'd forgotten the wool, oh, and you. I sat around the the. the Oh, I'm speaking of table. Which, oh, I've left them in the car. Yeah. With all your family, and we put I together the, um, in the, car. the first brochure. That was very spot. kind, and I had forgotten. Yeah, well, actually, I have to charge you because I was actually in the business. You're forgiven. <laughs> um, anyway, mm -hmm. one of the things we do, mm -hmm. by the way, from Topsy, thank you for reminding me, um, mm -hmm. is that every newborn on the island. Uh, gets a free lambskin from us. Mm -hmm. um, my husband was part, uh, he was chair of the committee that restarted the, the restaurant mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. it's totally volunteer run. We, uh, we engage as much as we can. Yeah, truly. Mm -hmm. Folks, I'm very sorry, but um, Ferry's really one minute. Would you come up to the car yep. with me? I'm bringing the brochure with you. Yep, thank you, Sally. Yeah. Thank you very thank you. much. to come in response to that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>